If you grew up in the 50s, maybe you had roller skates, a jump rope, or Buster Brown shoes just like these. This pair belonged to a girl named Denise McNair. She wore them on the last day of her life, September 15, 1963, the day she became one of the first casualties of the baby boomer generation, a martyr and a struggle that changed the face of America. Denise's parents, Chris and Maxine McNair, still live with the murder of their child. The mere fact that it happened when it happened, it still baffles me to this day. Do you find any comfort in the fact that this horrendous, hateful, cowardly act that cost you your daughter's life in some way brought the kind of change that was overdue in America? That had to happen in order for changes to be made. Not knowing that I would be one of the people who would have to make the supreme sacrifice. Her daughter, Denise, was bright and playful, devoted to her dog and her favorite doll. But being a black child and baby boomer in Birmingham, Alabama, then meant growing up in one of the most segregated and violent cities in the country. There were sights and sounds meant to terrify Denise and everyone she knew. The city's nickname was Bombingham. One of Denise's friends, Carolyn McKinstry, recalls why. Bombings were a way of life in Birmingham. We could be sitting on our porch any time, any evening, and we would hear the sound even at the age of 12, 13, 14. We had come to know the sound of the bomb. The bombs were the work of the KKK, made in the USA terror a shameful time. In 1963 Birmingham, many parents, terrified of losing their homes and jobs, were afraid to speak out. But not their children. Gwen Webb Appling was 14 when she went to a special meeting at the 16th Street Baptist Church. And I think it will mean a great deal to our movement. Dr. Martin Luther King was in the pulpit, appealing to the black community to fill the city's jails in protest. Dr. King, he asked who would go how many people could he depend on? Who could go in the movement with him? And I looked around and everybody that started standing up was us kids. It was just the kids that were standing. And so began the idea for a children's march through downtown. Thousands of kids, baby boomers all, wanted to take part. And Chris McNair's daughter, Denise, was no exception. She wanted to go in March, and uh, her mother and another lady told her that you were too small to march. And she immediately looked at them and said, hey, you're not little, why aren't you marching? The march started out as a festive, nonviolent protest. But then the police turned dogs and fire hoses on the young crusaders. And hundreds of Negroes reeling and sprawling among the trees here. The marchers, some as young as six and seven, were arrested. But the courage of these baby boomers, witnessed by millions across the country on network television news, had a powerful effect. A week later, business owners in downtown Birmingham agreed to desegregate lunch counters, restrooms, and water fountains. The movement kept gaining momentum. That summer, the whole world was listening as Dr. King shared a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. A few days after the march on Washington, Birmingham schools were desegregated. But with all the hope in the air, hate did not disappear. White fanatics are calling for physical resistance. The city is determined to maintain order. Birmingham's racial troubles have not yet run their course. On Sunday morning, September 15th, Denise McNair and three of her friends, Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson and Cynthia Wesley were preparing to take part in the youth service at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The sermon was to be a love that forgives, but no one heard it. At 10.22 a.m. on Sunday, there was an explosion. The windows came crashing in. I heard a few screams. 
And then I heard someone say, hit the floor. And then I heard feet. Maxine McNair, Denise's mother, was upstairs. We heard the blast, and my first words were, my baby, my baby. Members of the KKK had planted dynamite outside the room where Denise and her friends had gathered. All four were found dead in the rubble. Maxine McNair had to go from church to the morgue. And I went there and saw her on that slab in the morgue. And it just tore me up inside. I just couldn't believe it. Only in death did Denise McNair get her wish to speak out for equal rights. Her senseless murder became a turning point. White Americans said, wait a minute, young black girls in all white at church that day where the litany and the lesson was about the love that forgives. This is what they were studying in Sunday school. Michael Eric Dyson is a professor and author who has written extensively about Dr. King and the movement. There was an awakening, in a way, about what was going on here racially. Yeah, when I think about the 16th Street bombing forced America to see how barbaric and how much terror America had permitted, America would no longer begin to take business as usual, the racial segregation and the horrible deterioration of relationships between the races. As outrage replaced fear, America said, enough. Only months after the church bombing, President Lyndon Johnson led the passage of the Civil Rights Act. I urge every American to join in this effort to bring justice and hope to all our people. That long overdue legislation paved the way for a new diversity in business, politics, and ultimately the White House, the historic legacy of a struggle born by and for a generation. They were at the forefront of the movement. They were on the front lines. In many ways, their courage has made it possible for me to do what I do and many others who followed afterward to become successful. Were it not for those four young girls, black children of the 50s and 60s might not have grown up to be doctors and lawyers or secretaries of state, like Denise McNair's schoolmate, Condoleezza Rice. But the story doesn't end there. In the deaths of Denise and her three friends, there still was unfinished business. It took decades to bring their murderers to justice. It was a deep-seated, obviously, hatred of yeah. anybody of color. Uh, yeah, well, and, it, and, and what we found was it wasn't just of people of color. It was, it was Catholics, it was Jews. They Doug were, Jones was the U.S. attorney, a baby boomer himself, who wouldn't let the case go untried. You and those four young girls shared a generation. You were all baby boomers. Right. And the arc of your lives came together in a courtroom, in a matter of speaking. It certainly not escaped me that those children were essentially my age uh, at the time that they died. I was not one of those people on the front lines in Alabama at the time, but there was a group of us who later came who were able to kind of help right some of those wrongs and to help finish the job that some of those folks started back in 1963. And there is, I think, it's an army and it's a legion that continues to, to this day. Denise McNair died eight weeks shy of her 12th birthday, her epitaph etched in stone.